In my last lecture, I totally indulged in my so-called man crush. So the lecture's title on YouTube, Italian Baroque Painting, was somewhat misleading. Caravaggio was not the only Italian Baroque painter. Many of Caravaggio's contemporaries, in fact, preferred Caracci and his over-the-top ceiling paintings that, like the ceiling painting in Il Gesù, used illusionistic techniques. Artemisia Gentileschi, on the other hand, followed Caravaggio's example with dramatic tenebrism, open compositions, and an unflinching interest in violence. You remember her personal history, right? I do find it intriguing that women painters so frequently painted themselves in the act of pursuing their craft. We'll see another of these ex of examples in this unit and the next. We know from her letters that Artemisia Gentileschi fought prejudice against women painters and struggled to get paid for her work. In the end, however, she actually achieved a level of acceptance that eluded that bad boy Caravaggio. Grand Duke Cosimo de' Medici became a major patron, and so did King Charles I of England. And speaking of Charles I, this is another old AP favorite that didn't make the cut, but I'm going to use it as a segue to the paintings of Flanders and Spain, and more specifically the works of Peter Paul Rubens and Diego Velazquez. Both were Catholic painters of the Counter-Reformation, but more importantly, at least for interpreting our required work, both were court painters who were employed to portray and reinforce the authority of Catholic monarchs. Remember, this wasn't just an age of religious wars. The 17th century also witnessed the rise of nation states with absolutist monarchs who had the motivation and the resources to commission works that celebrated and reinforced their power and authority. Anthony van Dyck was a Flemish painter who trained under Rubens and followed him into royal service. Charles I was a king of England best known for getting his head lopped off during the English Civil War. On to the first of today's Baroque superstars, Peter Paul Rubens. Rubens was a classically educated humanist scholar and diplomat who was knighted by both Philip IV of Spain and Charles I of England. Although his father, interestingly enough, was a Calvinist, Rubens was raised as a Catholic in Flanders, which was a Catholic bastion of the Holy Roman Empire. Rubens traveled to Venice as a young man, where he was deeply influenced by Titian and Caravaggio. He also studied Greek and Renaissance sculptures, and like so many Baroque artists, was blown away by our old friend, the Hellenist sculpture, sculptor of the Trojan priest Lycoon and Sons. Here we see Rubens' Baroque descent from the cross, which you may have already encountered, next to Titian's High Renaissance Entombment, which I didn't include in your group exercise. So what similarities and differences do you observe? Both painters use deep, rich colors and employ light for emphasis. Rubens was influenced by the way Titian's looser brush strokes captured the play of light, as you see in the detail of a cloak on the left and the woman's hair on the right. Another similarity with Titian is they both loved to paint female flesh, although Rubens' nudes tended to have a lot more of it. But note that the composition of the works is different. The twisting figures and diagonal lines of Rubens' deposition clearly mark it out as a Baroque work. And here on the right is Caravaggio's entombment. What similarities and differences do you see between these two paintings? Both paintings employ a diagonal composition, but Rubens' colors are brighter and his chiaroscuro is not as sharply defined as Caravaggio's. I would not really describe it as tenebrism. The Rubens painting that the College Board chose for the list is not, however, one of his Counter-Reformation religious paintings, but instead one of a series of 24 paintings that Rubens made for a political patron, the former queen and regent of France, Marie de Medici. Let's watch a short video clip from an old but good art history series uh, video series that you've seen before. This segment focuses on Rubens' political and religious paintings, and it gives you a glimpse of still more Marie de Medici in art. A little background, Marie de Medici was the wife of Henry IV of France, who in fact was one of the most interesting figures of this stormy historical era. A Protestant, or Huguenot, Henry fought the Two other Henrys, it's actually called the War of the Three Henrys, over the right to rule France. He won, but only after he agreed to convert to Catholicism in order to have Catholic parents agree to accept his rule. 
Henry IV now needed a Catholic wife, and Marie de Medici came well connected to the Roman papal hierarchy. You do recognize that last name, right? Henry IV was assassinated in 1610, and Marie became regent for her young son, Louis XIII. She was not a great ruler. The chaos that Henry IV had pretty much suppressed now returned, but she fought hard to stay in control of France. Eventually, her son, with the help of his minister, Richelieu, banished her from the court. Marie and Louis reconciled a few years later, and she remodeled the luxurious palace of Luxembourg to hold these paintings, which were part of her propaganda campaign to regain political influence in France. It didn't work. In 1631, Louis XIII banished her again, this time from France, and she died in exile. Mom was just too much trouble. Marie de Medici had the money to pay her bills, so Rubens took the job, but the cycle presented some real artistic challenges. Truth is, Marie de Medici was not nearly as important as she wanted to portray herself, especially on this many canvases. So Rubens had to stretch to elevate her status, and he did it mostly by painting the queen hanging out with a lot of mythological heavy hitters. In the painting on the left, which used to show up on past AP tests, Marie de Medici is arriving in France from Italy. A personified France kneels dramatically before her. Below her, three sea nymphs and the god of the seas celebrate her arrival, holding the ship steady so that she can disembark safely. Gag moves the spoon, they used to say in the old days. In the Felicity of the Regency on the right, Marie is shown in, the allegor in allegorical fashion as the personification of justice itself and flanked by a retinue of some of the primary personifications gods in the Greek and Roman pantheon. Back to our required work. I hope you watched the excellent Khan Academy podcast about this work because I'm not going to repeat all of the points our, our historians made. There's a little truth underneath all the Gopher Baroque mythological allegory. The king did receive portraits of his future bride. Here's one portrait of a young Marie de Medici that survived and looks a little like the image of Marie in the Rubens painting. But the king was not immediately smitten. In fact, he was very devoted to his current mistress, and he was caught up with affairs of state. When his advisor announced the finalization of the marriage contract, Henry exclaimed, you say that I must be married. So I simply must be. Romantic guy. But Rubens, who knew who was paying his bills, pulled out all the stops. Jupiter and Juno, accompanied by their symbols, the eagle and the peacock, looked down benevolently at the couple. The ancient gods of marriage and love, Hymen and Cupid to the left and right, respectively, hover in midair as they present this portrait to Henry IV, the King of France. The flaming torch in Hymen's left hand symbolizes the ardor of love. The personification of France hovers over the king's shoulder to say, yes, your country needs this wife. The painting is not especially subtle about the benefits that Marie de Medici will bring to the marriage. Henry IV, at the time of his marriage, was almost 50. What he needed was an heir. Marie bore him six children, which was arguably her biggest political accomplishment. Note that the only figure in the entire work who stares right out directly at the viewer is Marie de Medici in her self-portrait. For this reason, the painting draws our initial focus to the queen, and that in itself is significant. In paintings that portrayed both men and women, especially political paintings, artists more often made male figures the main focus of the work. Okay, another confession time. I have a man crush on Caravaggio, but I am not a huge Rubens fan. Still, I really like this painting. It's the one I would have put on the list if they'd made me a member of the College Board AP Art History ruling junta. Rubens was not only a court painter, but he was also a diplomat. He tried unsuccessfully to negotiate peace between Catholic Spain and Protestant England in hopes that England would stop helping the rebellious Dutch. While Rubens' diplomatic efforts were a failure, he did have a front row seat for the horrors of war and a personal stake in bringing them to an end. In this allegorical painting, we see Europe flinging up her arms in despair. We see figures representing the arts being trampled. The Fury Electo, who represents the horrors unleashed by war, appears to me at least to be almost demented. 
So why would I say that this is a vintage Rubens, typical of Rubens? Think of an attribution question. Note the extreme sense of movement, the dramatic and rather light use of color, sometimes described as coloristic, the full-figured ladies, the use of mythological symbols. Rubens, if you'll pardon a little punning, was, is ripe for an attribution question. I need to move on, but let me make one more point about Rubens, and this is something I really could see showing up on the test. Rubens ran his studio as a veritable painting factory. He employed a large workshop of assistants. They would do much of the actual painting, following the oil sketches and detailed drawings which Rubens provided. He would supervise their work and make changes where necessary, and he finished off all but the cheapest productions with the touch of his own hand. Rubens considered people his specialty, but he often turned to others for help with plants and animals. Interestingly, one of his closest friends and collaborators was our old buddy Bruegel, who is a favorite of mine. In this painting, Rubens apparently painted Adam, Eve, and the horse and left most of the plants and animals to Bruegel. They both signed the work. Okay, on to Spain. In geopolitical terms, the 1600s were not kind to Spain. The gold from the New World brought runaway inflation, and the religious wars depleted Spain's treasury without obliterating Protestantism or even preserving, in the long run, Spanish rule over the Netherlands. Yet these years of Spanish decline would, somewhat ironically, bring the greatest flowering of Spanish painting. Philip IV was Philip II's grandson. Philip II was the great warrior of the counter-revolution, son of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. Anyway, Philip IV's court painter and among the greatest painters of the Baroque era was Diego Velazquez. Velazquez did the best he could with some really unpromising material. Philip IV had a particularly exaggerated form of the unfortunate Habsburg chin. The painter basically stole our attention away from that unfortunate face by painting the king's elegant clothing in superb detail. So here's a famous painting by Velazquez that doesn't portray royalty or, of course, show up on our required works list. But whose influence do you see? As I warned in my lecture, the answer to that question, at least for this period in art history, so often is going to turn out to be Caravaggio. What Caravaggio elements can you identify in this painting? The central figure looks a lot like Caravaggio's sensual boys. But we also see theatrical spotlighting, the pronounced chiaroscuro, and the open construction that spills off the canvas. On the other hand, the tenebrism is less pronounced, a little more Rubens modulated chiaroscuro. And while this is a mythological and not a biblical scene, it seems to me that here again we have the world of the gods dropping down into the lives of ordinary people. Drum rolls. This is one of the most famous paintings in art history. Sister Wendy calls it the greatest painting and the story of painting. Although, alas, we're not going to have time to see that clip. So let's start with your reactions. Why would this, was this painting such a big deal? Remember, I asked that question also about the calling of Matthew. Where is the light coming from? Look toward the middle of the painting on the right. That's the Prime Minister of Spain and the Velasquez's paymaster. He's opening the door to let in light. Actually, art historians still debate about what's going on here. Are the king and queen watching Velasquez, shown standing before his easel, painting their daughter? Is the princess looking out at her parents, reflected to us in the mirror, or is she looking at us? Note the shout out to Jan van Eyck's Arnolfini marriage and the use of the mirror and the inclusion of the artist in the painting. Here are a couple of details from the painting. We see that the Velasquez, we see Velasquez wearing the mark of nobility that he hasn't yet managed to attain, though he will. According to tradition, King Philip IV personally painted this onto the canvas after Velasquez's death. And the couple in the mirror are pretty clearly the king and queen. That horrible chin is a dead giveaway. Are they included to make this a more complete family portrait? Because they're the subject of the painting? To suggest that Velasquez is almost a member of the royal family, privy to their most intimate moments? The little princess is clearly the painting's focal point, its central figure. Note how she's bathed in an almost theatrical spotlight. Yet, 
I would argue that it's her dwarf maid of honor who is the emotional center of the painting. Velasquez has imbued her face with enormous dignity. This is a woman who has not let deformity defeat her. So what do you notice about the brush strokes? Look especially at the little princess's sleeves. They are broad and easily visible. Remember that art historians use the term loose to describe this kind of brush stroke. The paint is actually laid on quite thickly in a technique you've encountered before, and the term for that is impasto. Oops, I meant to include this, include this slide in your workbook, and I'll stick it in for the future. One of the AP Classroom videos discusses the thesis that Las Meninas demonstrates and indeed maybe deliberately emphasizes Spain's role as ruler of a vast empire in Asia and Latin America. The red ceramic cup that the Infanta Margarita is reaching for may well be a bucaro produced in Guadalajara, New Spain, now Mexico. You see a bucaro in the upper right-hand corner. Spanish ceramics were not as glossy as New World bucaros. Moreover, the tray under the cup is clearly made of silver, and for Spain, silver was the most important product from the New World. As much as 980,000 pounds of silver were imported at the height of production. Silver brought great wealth and, ultimately, devastating inflation to Spain. And finally, the red curtains that we kind of see reflected in the mirror were probably dyed red with cochineal, a chemical derived from crushing the bodies of beetles found primarily in the Americas. Now, I personally find it unlikely that the would-be aristocrat Velazquez was offering subtle hints of his opposition to colonialism. But it is pretty clear that this painting gives evidence of, and even pays tribute to, the globalization produced by empires, a theme I will return to in my next lecture. Here's another related observation from a prominent British art critic. He wrote, The intruder at the brightly lit door is a tense presence. He might have brought bad news from a far imperial province. The painting speaks of oceanic distances that make messages and orders difficult, that make the monarch a remote icon of power. He continues, even here, an intimate company, the king is alone, so might he, he might be portrayed indirectly in a mirror like the Medusa. Only one person looks openly back at the monarch. Only one person is his true friend, courageous and honest, and that is the man on whose painted chest, it was said, the king himself would add the cross of St. James. Note, by the way, that this author has a somewhat different interpretation. He doesn't think that this was the prime minister of Spain. At any rate, the art critic in the next video clip, in turn, will use this image to expand on his interpretation of Las Meninas. Okay, I really don't have a lot to add to these experts. They know a lot more than I do. Except to note that this is a painting that has obviously fascinated and puzzled its audience for centuries. And it continues to generate new theories. That alone suggests its greatness as well as its mystery. We'll close, if you have time, with another clip from the Art of the Western World. By the way, you should recognize the fellow who's explaining Las Meninas to us, or at least you should recognize his voice. It's our old friend Simon Shama, except he's actually a young friend here, and he hasn't yet learned how to speak to the camera. I think it's kind of cute. I was a lot younger when I first saw this painting, too. In our next lecture, we will continue with Spanish art, but the art of New Spain, or what we now call Latin America.